Thank you very much, Charlie. Uh, thank you for the invitation, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, <clears throat> so I've been charged with to give you a quick overview of botulinum toxin, and you may, some of you may know more than others, so if I, if some of it seems very simplistic, uh, please forgive me because there are others in the room that may know less, and, and so I'll just try to make it brief. Um, I can, in 10 minutes, I can only cover a little bit of stuff so that there are some books that we've written. I wrote this book, uh, this is in the second edition, came out I think last year with Mitchell Brin, a movement disorders neurologist, and Lori Ramig, who is a speech therapist at Boulder, Colorado, and really an expert, particularly in Parkinson's disease. And so there's a lot in there about movement disorders of the larynx. And uh, a book that we wrote really for clinicians, but for anyone else that would like, it's a book on using botulinum neurotoxins for a whole bunch of head and neck disorders. So what is botulinum toxin? It's produced by the bacterium Clostridium botulinum. It comes in, um, in several different flavors. They're antigenically uh, dissimilar, A through, through G. Um, and fortuitously, uh, Ed Chance, who was at the University of Wisconsin during World War II and was moved to Fort Detrick to isolate and uh, crystallize botulinum toxin, purify it, uh, to be used as a potential uh, bioweapon against the Germans. So he was kept there during the war, and then when he went back to the University of Wisconsin, his, suddenly his laboratory, which had been a little closet, became a whole floor at the university, sponsored by the DOD and the CDC. And uh, that laboratory, Ed Chance, died about a year and a half ago at 95, and it's been taken over by one of his postdocs, Eric Johnson, who runs that laboratory now also. And so they, <clears throat> they found, Ed Chance originally isolated um, type A toxin, and for a lot of reasons, and I'll show you some of, the, some of the things, a lot of reasons A may be the best one of all of them, uh, and that was just by chance, that that's what he was working with and that's what we have. And now that some of the others have been investigated in the laboratory, they seem less good. Now, along with that, in Eric Johnson's laboratory, they subtyped antigenically distinct A, B, and E toxin. And so there are now six different A toxins that have been found made by bacteria. We're all using the A1 type because those are the ones that are that have been tested and are commercially available. And B, there's one B type called myoblock, which is uh, B1, but there, are, there are, are seven B types that have now been identified, and E, which is not available for treatment yet, uh, there are several other types of those too. The, the reason that becomes important is you hear and you read in the literature some about people that have antibody to toxin and it doesn't work so much. And so if you develop antibody to the A1 toxins, you destroy them before they can work. You don't have, you don't die because you have an allergic reaction, but you destroy the toxin. You're blocking antibodies and you destroy it. And so when, you, when that happens, then you have to move to the B toxin. And the B toxin works, but it's not quite as, the results aren't quite as good or as long lasting as, as with A. Uh, there is an A2 toxin in clinical trials in Tokyo. Uh, Ryuji Kaji, who is a neurologist there, is working with his university and a company on trying to popularize an A2 toxin, which will work the same as A1, but it will not be, if you have antibody to A1, you will not block A2. And he, in his work, at least my conversations with him, he, he believes that there may be some other benefits to A2 that are a little different than A1. So that remains to be seen. But anyway, so there's some on the horizon on trying to make what we do better with the toxin. So how does it work? This is a little cartoon showing a nerve ending. And in the nerve ending, you see these little balls. And the balls are, um, they're, they're, little they're little vesicles containing, in this case, a neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. And so you see those little granules. And these little, ve these little vesicles come down and they bond, they dock at this, you see in the, let's see if I can point over here. These are docking proteins called snare proteins. And what happens is these little balls come in contact with these snare proteins and they're dragged to the nerve, uh, to the membrane, and then they release their 
whatever they're releasing, in this case acetylcholine. And the toxins all work by cleaving different parts of the snare protein. So in the, in the case of A toxin, I can't see through here so well, but you can see here SNAP25. This is one strand of the docking protein, and A cleaves it. I don't know if you can see that over here. But you can see all of the other toxins, including tetanus toxin, all work on these snare proteins. It turns out that so by doing that, it breaks that, and so now this little ball comes down, it docks, but it can't contract, and then it can't release. And so the more toxin you have, the more nerve endings you can create a cleavage. It's an enzyme, and it cleaves part of this protein. The more rele the decreased release you can produce. And so it's dose-related. The more toxin you have, the more things are weak. So if you have systemic botulism, when you eat poison food, it sits in your stomach and it manufactures toxin. And over time, you keep absorbing toxin, which gets out into your bloodstream and begins to weaken muscle until you're too weak to breathe and move around, and then you die. So by giving small amounts of this, you can weaken small amounts of muscle and create a situation where something that worked too much now works less and so the spasms and things that we see in dystonia uh, are less, uh, less evident. The other thing that's very important uh, to realize be, uh, as a precursor to this discussion is, as has been brought up earlier by Dr. Bastian and others, uh, we're not treating disease, okay? We're treating symptom. And so the, this is one tool. I started in this business doing Herb Dito's nerve section operation because that was the only thing that, that we had. <clears throat> but we had a number of failures. We had some people who did very well, but we had a number of failures. And so the, the success is to try to find other tools that we have that may be uh, reversible. If you get a bad response, toxin wears off. If you cut the nerve, nerve is cut forever. So those were, those were some of our problems initially. And is toxin the best treatment for, botulinum, for spasmodic dysphonia? No, botulinum toxin is the best thing that we may have right now with or without surgery, with or without um, oral agents. I mean, all, some people need a whole combination of, of things and there's not one right treatment. The treatment is what fits each individual because we're treating your symptom. Until we can treat the disease, which is to manipulate the brain, and I guess we'll talk maybe more about that this afternoon in Christie's panel on research, until we treat the areas in the brain that are not working, uh, we can't treat the disease appropriately. We can modify the symptom. And so this is one way of modifying modifying the symptom. The other thing that makes it difficult, which pa patients of mine come all the time and they say, well, why don't you have a cure for this yet? Well, part of the reason is that what you have is not a disease, you have a symptom. And, and I make it, uh, the analogy that I use is that people can come into a doctor's office limping, and the limp is the symptom. But the reason for the limp may be that they hurt their knee, or they had ACL surgery, <laughs> or that they have a splinter in their foot, or they broke their hip last week, or they have arthritis, or a million other things. But the, the result of it is that they have a limp. So you can't find one treatment for that limp because there's a multitude of reasons that they may have it. And so it makes it difficult for us to be able to decipher in each of you why do you have it? I mean, that's the, that's the question I always get when we make this diagnosis and say, well, why do I have this? Well, we, there are some things that we can, we can fess out. There are some people that have it on a genetic basis. Some people have it from trauma or a stroke or some other underlying diseases. 60% have it on, we don't know, idiopathic. And until we have better scanning techniques and blood tests and genetic data, we're not going to know. So at the best, the moment, the best we can do is to try to treat each individual, and you have to find what works best for you. Is toxin the only treatment? No. It works for a lot of people. It's a good tool that we have, but if it doesn't work for you, then you do something else. And uh, so with that little preamble, <clears throat> so here, here are the strands and they break. So the other thing that we know, and this makes the whole system a little bit more complicated, maybe Christy will talk a little bit about it this afternoon, is that 
in looking at what the snare proteins do, the basic scientists have now found that everything that's released in the body, hormones, uh, inflammatory mediators, and other things are all released by the same snare proteins. Therefore, uh, in some of our work early on, going back probably to 1990, we found that injecting some people, they stopped getting migraine headaches, and now migraine headache, chronic migraines on label, because it does interfere with pain syndromes. And so it does it by, you can see in this little cartoon, the release of different, um, different uh, tra neurotransmitters and inflammatory agents from nerves that can be blocked by using botulinum toxin. In addition, uh, naked fibers, it doesn't go through something called Schwann cells, which are the sheaths of nerves, the covering, like the plastic over a copper wire, but it will go directly into the copper wire. So it will go into naked C fibers and partially myelinated A delta fibers. Why is that important? Because the, the muscle spindles that give a sensory signal back to the brain are innervated by these afferent nerves and they also are affected by the toxin, but we don't yet have good tools to measure that. We don't know if there are, I know Christy did some work early on on looking at sensory experiences on the other side of this equation because each action that you have or that any of us have, whether you move your finger or you move your vocal cords, it, a sensory signal is sent from the muscle back to the brain telling the brain what the muscle just did so it can coordinate the next, next muscle action. And so that allows you to do very precise actions with a finger, say. If you interfere with that signal or scramble the interpretation of that signal, things come down in a very chaotic way. And so the coordination of vocal cords that need to open and close to make sound end up getting stuck and then they open and you get this choppy speech or tightness or spasms. And that needs to be fixed, but we don't know how to fix it yet. But it is true that the toxin may also have a, an, an effect on the sensory system, only we don't know how to measure that. But there's no doubt in, in using, Kaji used phenol and, and uh, xylocaine in hands but people with writer's dystonia and got the same kind of results as you can get with people with botulinum toxin. And all that did was affect muscle spindles. So we know that there's an afferent component to all of this. And so here was a little cartoon showing in pain, if you stimulate a pain fiber, it goes, you get some kind of reflex, it goes to the central nervous system, you get release of glutamate and some other things in the central nervous system, and then there's this re in a, a reactivation of the sensory nerves and the motor nerves downhill. So this is called peripheral sensitization. And that causes more brain response. So it changes the brain response just by, over, by, just by having an overactive muscle. If you give botulinum toxin, you can block that. And so you don't get the central sensitization and thresholds are different. This is only all on the sensory side. So if you add in the motor side, you can imagine at many of the things that we do. And so why do you have sensory tricks? You fool the central nervous system in some way so that the phenomenology isn't the same. So here's a little list of uh, the botulinum toxins that are, that are available. Botox is the one that we know in the United States the best because it's been around in the United States the longest and it has multiple things and they advertise for a lot of different indications. It's from Allegan in Irvine, California. And since that time, others have moved into the United States. Disport, which is now made by Ibsen, uh, has been in, in Europe uh, probably five years or six years less than Botox was. They came later in, in but it's also an atoxin. It's compounded differently. The units are different. The administration has to be slightly different, and the dosing has to be different. Uh, but it, there's a long history of its use in Europe uh, for this and other dystonias, and it works pretty well. Zeomin is a German toxin made by the Mertz company. It's that whole aggregate that I showed you in the beginning, the 150 kilodalton molecule, but the, when the bacteria makes it, it has a whole bunch of little proteins around it. And what these people did was to try to remove those because they thought that it might work better and there'd be less, uh, fewer people that would develop antibody. <laughs> That's not so clear, but it is a good toxin. It's another A1 toxin. So if, I mean, I get these patients that come and say, you know, I develop antibody to Botox. Can you give me Dysport or give me Zeomin? If you have antibody to A1 toxin, you have antibody to all of them. 
So to waste your money getting Zeoman and then Dysport and whatever is a waste of time. At the moment, then you have to go to B2, B toxin because that's antigenically different. When A2 toxin is around, then, then you'll be, be able to get that. Um, there are some others. There's a, there's a Korean toxin called Neuronox. Uh, it's in clinical trials, not available yet. <coughs> there's a, there was a, 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 another A1 naked toxin called PureTox that was uh, started by Upjohn and then sold to Mentor and uh, went to Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson had it in phase three trials until a week ago, and then they stopped. I have no idea of why. I mean, they're a big player with a lot of money, so we thought there would be good competition. But the word, the preliminary word that I got is that they pulled their clinical trial. Now, whether they did that because in the midst of the trial they had adverse events that may not be toxin-related, it may be dose-related or injector-related, I don't know. But at the moment, the trial has stopped, and I don't know what's going to happen with that product. And then there are some others, some others around that you hear. There's a Brazilian toxin, the Chinese toxin. Many, many clinicians, you know, think, oh, this is good because it's uh, it's sold for about half price or less. But there are a lot of unknowns, including manufacturing processes, and and they link it instead of using, uh, they link it to gelatin, and we don't know where the gelatin comes from. Are these BSE free herds? So you don't end up with prion disease, you know as a consequence of getting the toxin. So there's a lot that the Chinese don't say. And in Japan, this toxin is banned from the country. It can't be imported, it can't be used in research, can't be used for anything. Of course, there's a political issue between China and Japan anyway, <laughs> but, but that's just another, another thing. And research toxins, there are A toxins available that, you can, that researchers can buy online um, but these are not meant for human consumption. And the example is that case in Florida where uh, a guy uh, who had lost it or his license was suspended, injected himself and his girlfriend and a couple, and they all got botulism because he misread the dosing. And he gave them something like a hundredfold dose that they should have gotten, and they all ended up in the hospital. So this is just a, a little rundown of the things available. I would stick with the ones that we have experience with and that we know work. So the history is that in the early 1970s, a pediatric ophthalmologist, Alan Scott, began looking for a, 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 an agent where he could further weaken muscle, particularly in kids with strabismus where he was doing surgery and he didn't get quite the response he needed. He needed just a little bit more weakness to get conjugate vision where the two eyes work together. And so he started in his garage and then in a monkey lab looking at cobra venom and alpha bungrotoxin, all kinds of things that worked on muscle, and ran into Ed Chance from the University of Wisconsin who said, you know, I have botulinum toxin, you ought to try that. It's very dependable. And so he began working with that and then set up clinical trials for strabismus and then for blepharospasm and other focal dystonia. And uh, from there, the FDA issued some INDs to uh, Stan Fine at Columbia, whom I worked with, uh, uh, Mark Hallett at the uh, NIH that Christy worked with, and uh, Joe Jankovic at, at Baylor. And so these were the three centers that began looking at for all kinds of other, other uh, dystonias. And uh, so <clears throat> Scott began looking at some other focal dystonias. Uh, it started to be used for torticollis. We did the first jaw for oromandibular dystonia in 1984 and injected the first spasmodic dysphonia patient in 1984. He was a patient who had blepharospasm and said, I want the stuff that I'm getting here and here. And he was a very brave man, but was in the paramedical field as an equipment developer. And uh, he, he just knew that it was going to help him. And so that, that was what prompted the first injection. Very scary. We had him in the ICU. We didn't, Trach said at his bedside, we didn't know what was going to happen to him. Uh, but he did well. And I still have, I don't see him anymore, but I still have one patient that I injected this week uh, who I've been continually injecting for 30 years. And she continually has good voice. Uh, so the answer, what happens if I get it for a long time? Am I going to die? Am I going to get botulism? The answer is no. Is it going to stop working? Unless you develop antibody, it's not going to stop working. Her doses fluctuate a little bit as her symptoms do, but they're still in the same range that they've been over the last 30 years, and she continues to function well. 
So long-term use does not have a ne necessarily a negative impact except on your wallet. <laughs> and to show how it's expanded from Alan Scott's original two uses, this is just kind of a partial list of things that botulinum toxins now are used to treat. So you see pain syndromes, all kinds of muscle spasms in different places. Cosmetic, which is the big seller for these uh, companies. So the results are uh, to show that it actually works. And uh, looking at Witzel et al. looked at translaryngeal pressures after toxin. They decreased by 69% in their study. Improvement in acoustic measurements and airflow at one month has been well documented. In our series, which is now over 1,400 patients in 30 years, uh, the average onset is about 2.5 days. The average peak effect, about nine days. The average duration, 15.1 weeks. And our average benefit as patients uh, judge themselves is 89.7% of normal function. The side effects are some get mild transient breathiness, a mild cough on drinking fluids that usually disappear. Some have a local pain, itch, or rash. So one of the ways that I think you get the best results based on doing this for 30 years, if we're treating your symptom, then we have to find a scheme and a dose that works for you as an individual. And it, if you look at a lot of centers, they have like one or two different doses and they inject once a month and patients have to come when they're injecting and they mix stuff up. And from a, a clinician's point of view, I understand that because it's just easier to have like one session and yet every, that day that's what you do like when you go to the operating room and then you do other things on other days. But that doesn't always fit your lives. Sometimes you need an injection two weeks from now and there's no appointment because it's not going to be done for another month. And that month the guy's out of town so you have to wait for the following month. And uh, it, that's not the way of obtaining optimum results. The other thing is, what do you, do you only inject one side or both sides? Where we've been down this road a long time and found, as you can see, <laughs> the bulk of our patients get bi small bilateral dosing. Our average dose is about 0.8 or 0.9 units per vocal cord. But some people can't tolerate that. And so we then do only one side. And about 10 to 15 percent of our people only have one side injected. And we go back and forth when it wears off, and they do fine. Some people need staggered injections, because if I do both at one time, they get wiped out. If I do only one side, it's not enough. So I'll do one side, let there be some recovery. So why is there some recovery? Some people in, are injected, then they're breathy for a little bit, and then their voice gets better, and then that persists. And the reason is I showed you that cartoon where you have those snare proteins, and the enzyme breaks the snare protein to prevent the release of the neurotransmitter. Well, not all of them are fully broken. Some of them are repaired much more quickly, that is, within a week. And so that sort of downshoot and then upshoot, and then you kind of level off are those partially broken snare proteins that are repaired. And so by staggering, you can take that into account and not treat both sides at the same time. I have some people that get these mini doses more frequently. And so I think what we, what we do is we just try to find a scheme that works for each individual. I inject every week as long as I'm you know, not away. If I'm here, obviously I can't inject. But, uh, so, and that seems to work for a lot of people. And so several years ago, one of my fellows uh, looked at our results and found that there were basically these two kinds of curves. You see the top one where people get this little undershoot. They're, they're a little too weak, and then they come up and then they level off. And then the bottom one, which is the preferable one for us, which is that people just start getting better, and then within about a week or so, they hit that plateau and they continue. Now, this is a little different than the St. Louis study that was mentioned, which Randy Paniello did, where the, there, was, there were two doses, and, uh, and I forget the frequency. So if you only do that, you're going to have people that have, you know, there's an upswing while they're trying to gain back their voice, and then they have good voice, and they start dropping off. If you can individuate treatment, we find that they're pretty good for 80 to 90 percent at the time. So you're going to have a not-so-good thing in the beginning while they're regaining speech, and then it's going to fall off at the end when they come for treatment. And by doing that, you can see that you can extend the periods for rather long periods of time. So, and then for abductors, I'm not going to go into a lot, but abductors, as was pointed out, if you treat them, you're treating the muscle that you need to breathe. 
So if you weaken that muscle too much, then you have noisy breathing or you can't run, you know, jog in the morning or do play tennis or whatever because you, have, you can't open your airway enough. And so it becomes harder both technically but also because of the muscle in treating people with abductor because you have to balance breathing with speaking. And it's a challenge. And so at least one third of our patients that are abductors, maybe 40% are an oral agent also. That is one of the drugs the neurologists give to work on the brain. So you get less bad signal coming to the larynx. And then there's less for us to have to do in terms of weakening the muscles so people can breathe and, and speak. And you can see here, we, initially we did some other things like thyroplasties to try to put some kind of mechanical barrier and hold the vocal cord in from opening up. Christy Ludlow some time ago had shown abnormalities in the cricothyroid muscle uh, in some of these individuals. And so we tried injecting some of them to see whether we can change both the afferent, the sensory signal, and the efferent signal. Because if you have more than one muscle that's a little weak, as demonstrated in people that treat hands, the signals all come to the brain in a different way, and sometimes the phenomena disappear. And as you saw in the bottom, a 32% needed oral agent. And so the average best voice of our patients is a little under 70%, and the reason is I have to stop when I think that they're starting to have trouble breathing or I think that they're gonna have trouble breathing. If they're already making noise and they can't run up a flight of stairs, then I, I stop, even if they don't have the best voice, because having a tracheotomy is not a good trade-off. And there have been several people in this country that have had overly aggressive uh, abductor therapy and needed a tracheotomy for three months. And I don't think that's a good result of trying to make your voice better. So we stop, and, and then you try oral agent and other kinds of things. And you see the normal range and all. And these people, if you give them too much, they have trouble with dysphagia because some of it can leak out into the constrictor muscle, and then some of them have wheezing because the airway is too narrow. So what's the future of the toxins? The future of the toxins are we may have some better ones available, and then we're gonna to begin to have designer toxins. The basic scientists now can begin to manipulate the molecule. Pretty soon they won't have the bacterial grown ones, they'll have ones manufactured synthetically in the lab. And uh, Keith Foster, who uh, runs a company called Syntaxin, <clears throat> has taken, you can see the little cartoon over here on your, on your right, and he's taken part of that, that gold piece off chemically in the lab and began to make attachment molecules. So that little gold one is what attaches to, to the nerve. So if you can make, find specific uh, proteins on the different kinds of nerves that are only, that are unique to those nerves, you can then make this gold piece, an attachment piece called a ligand for, for specific for that kind of nerve. And so he's designed, uh, so-called endopeptidases that will now only bind to sensory nerves and not weaken motor nerves. So theoretically, if we could show that there was a big sensory component to dystonia, that if you change the sensory phenomena going to the brain, that the brain would function better, then maybe you don't have to weaken the muscle at all. And so you could use an endopeptidase that effect, affected only sensory nerve or only a gland or only an autonomic nerve. So the future of toxins is that you're gonna see designer toxins that may last for a longer period of time, that may attach only to specific nerves or cells, and, um, and we'll be able to create very specific changes in the body's physiology by using these toxins in a meaningful way. So that's the future. That's not the future of the treatment for your disease. The future of the treatment of your disease is gonna be when we can begin to treat the brain itself. And we'll talk more about that in Christie's panel this afternoon. So with that, I'd like to stop. And um, so the conclusion was that dystonia is a syndrome of uh, symptoms and the treatment should be the treatment of those symptoms until we can treat the disease and toxin is one way that we have. So with that, I'd like to go to the panel and ask you um, your good and bad experiences of using toxin to a bunch of people who are recipients. I think that the, the most common thing uh, and uh, I think the most important and significant 
significant to you is to have consistency in placement and dosing. And um, that is uh, something, as I mentioned before, is hard to figure out initially. Sometimes uh, just by uh, taking the law of averages, we get it right the first time, and that ends up being a very stable dose. But there are times when someone who uh, gets an average dose is weak and breathy for six weeks, and that's clearly at one side of the bell curve. And patients who have that experience, oftentimes uh, I hear from them frequently, and we talk things through, and, um, and many times it, uh, it's, uh, have, they have to be reassured that it will eventually wear off, and things will get better, and next time we're going to, to reduce the dose a lot. Um, there are patients who taking the average dose won't have any benefit at all. And to those patients, I say, we're going to try this again. Um, so for the adductory uh, patients, that's, I think, the most common thing. And that can be dealt with simply by going through a very regimented process of making sure we get the right timing and the right dosing and the right placement. Um, for the abductory folks, I don't think I've had anyone who's been really unsatisfied with being having too much. Uh, it's generally been, again, it's a little harder to get consistent results, um, and sometimes it means trying to, to place the dose in several different locations, kind of hedge your bet uh, into that PCA muscle um, that's harder to hit in hopes that the results will be more consistent and better. Sure. Yes. <coughs> I was just trying to organize, organize, to organize your thoughts. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess uh, a couple things about uh, pros and cons. Some of some of it has nothing. Some of the benefit or the perception of botulinum toxin administration has less to do with uh, the toxin than um, expectation management. So I think uh, a fair bit of our job is managed and. Dr. Bastian did a nice job of presenting this with expectations, like the fact that uh, there is an evolution to it, it may change over time, probably you should get, one thing we try to do at UW-Madison, for example, is a yearly full evaluation, so once a year everybody gets a comprehensive voice evaluation to make sure that we're not missing some of that evolution, whether they're having more SD, or excuse me, more abductor breaks, evolution of tremor, um, addition or regionalization of uh, the focal dystonia. Um, I would say that that, you know, if you're, if we think of the problem as a nail and all we have is a hammer, we're just going to continue to do the same thing and maybe play around with the dosages or different sites of muscles or et cetera. But if you're missing the big picture, then that's probably the easiest way to get off track. So that tends to play into results a little bit also. Um, another thing uh, that may uh, be of benefit is knowing uh, that clinicians are often uh, skilled at doing uh, the injections in different ways. So, uh, for example, some people have an aversion to neck things or visible needles or lying down or one of a hundred different things. There are different ways to administer the botulinum toxin, including through the mouth, uh, which is one way to do it, or uh, Harry Hoffman, our colleague from Iowa, reported on uh, injecting uh, actually fillers or other things, but you can deliver medicines such as Botox into the vocal folds through the nose uh, with a camera through the nose. With that, there's a little bit the downside of you lose a fair amount of uh, Botox and transfer through the small little plastic cannula that goes through the uh, transnasal scope, but that's another method. Um, some people can't stand the nose, some people can't stand the mouth, some people can't stand the neck. Um, furthermore, it makes sense to have that flexibility when there are other mitigating factors. For example, thyroidectomy is a very, very common uh, surgical procedure, particularly in women, uh, and particularly in women who may be of the age where they may also have spasmodic dysphonia. That creates a certain amount of scar in the area, uh, which may make the reliable administration and, uh, of uh, Botox on a regular basis more challenging in which case having some flexibility with technical issues may be advantageous. Um. Uh, to add 
to what's been said. I think a key for Botox success is to have a lot of patient input. And what I mean by that is that you have to understand very clearly exactly what it is that patients aren't liking about the initial side effects or duration or, in other words, you really do have to, to participate in telling your doctor exactly what it is you're trying to achieve. Um, the example, uh, one example of how to do that is we make voicemail available. So we say to our patients, call and they leave a voicemail on, not on someone else's voicemail, but on my voicemail. And I say, just tell me how long it was since your injection and what it is that's your, that's troubling you or that your question is, and then I will listen to it personally. And if you want to leave me a message every day or every week, that's fine. Leave as many as you like. And I think that helps because every now and again, you run into a peculiar circumstance where the, my understanding is not the same as the patient's understanding in any one of several ways that are kind of surprising, you know, and it's only through that battling to really get patient input that you can, uh, you know, uh, tweak or, or fix. Uh, another thing I'd say is that patients should take be very free to say, this is what I need from this injection. Exam two examples. One is a woman who came in after six weeks uh, from an injection, and I thought, M goodness, I must have missed, because six weeks is so short. And so I walked in and I said, oh, did, did you not get an effect this time? And she said, oh, no, my voice is perfect. But I found out three days ago that I have to go to Germany. I'm leaving next week, and I have to go to Germany for three months. And I don't want to be searching for a, a Botox injection in Germany, and I'll be right out of steam. Could I get injected again? And the answer is yes, of course. That makes complete sense. Uh, you see, so that's patient empowerment. Another one is a best-selling author who would get a, I think it was for nine months, I gave her injections every five weeks. Her normal is about 14, 15 weeks. But the reason is she publishes the book, and then suddenly, uh, she gets a call on Tuesday, and she's to be on the radio on Thursday, and so I see her Tuesday afternoon to do it. You see what I mean? So patient em uh, empowerment and on-demand availability and that kind of, of thing. And the last thing I would say is uh, new patients getting uh, Botox often have this sense of sort of competition with the Botox. I think I can go another week or I can, and it's, it's a mistake, it really is. And the way I put it, and, and for maybe for Kate DeVore and she's theater, but I say you should do the season ticket approach, not the per performance <laughs> approach. In other words, once you figure out that my typical interval is 15 weeks or 18 weeks or whatever it is, then just get on that schedule. So now and again, you'll arrive saying, well, I probably could have gone another week, but the problem is the very next day, if you don't, you might be in a, in a ditch, you see. So you just get on that sort of, I don't, you know, we go twice a year to have our teeth cleaned, and we don't say, hmm, you know, I think, I think maybe I can go a few more weeks before I, you know, we just know that every six months that thing comes up, and, and that is generally the best strategy for Botox. So there's one question that's uh, not specifically related to Botox, but I think uh, many of you may have, and it's worth uh, responding to. It says, um, <clears throat> a martini before dinner made a conversation after dinner wonderfully normal. Why? Well, one may, maybe if you have enough martinis, you don't care. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, the, but the truth is that there, there are alcohol receptors in the brain, and... Uh, there are well-known, as a well-known phenomena, that there are alcohol-responsive dystonia and alcohol-responsive tremor. That is, that people have a drink or a beer or a glass of wine, and in some people, their symptom goes away completely. And initially, we never believed this, but we had a, a young girl who was around 20, and she said if she goes and has a beer, uh, her voice is completely normal, but if she goes to school and has to present in class, she can't have a beer because then she doesn't know what she's saying, but she sounds good. So, so we didn't believe it, so we gave her money, we re video recorded, gave her money to go across the street and have a beer and come back, and she was, she was normal, you know, and then you say, oh, is it psychogenic or this and that? But the truth is, no. There are, alcohol, there are alcohol, well-known alcohol-responsive myoclonic disorders, tremor disorders, and, and dystonia. Uh, not everyone. And that's why when I said before 
that it's difficult. Why, why you know, when, uh, um, who was it? Someone said, oh, you know, they have, uh, you know, they got a Pilates helps this person or this and that. Some things help, you said it, right? That some things help people, but it doesn't help everybody. And, and because it's an individual disorder, uh, multifactorial, and so there's a lot of nuances that are not generic to everyone, but one of them that's fairly characteristic is there's a small group that are alcohol responsive. There is a drug that's in clinical trials now that we're working with some of the people who are alcohol responsive uh, called Zyrem or sodium oxabate. It binds to alcohol receptors so it can have the same effect as the alcohol without the intoxication. So if it works, you take the drug, the symptoms get better or they can even go away in some, in some individuals. And, it, and uh, you know, if there's one wants to have enough data then in a good clinical trial, then maybe it'll be on label for that right now. The trouble is it's not labeled for that. I think the only, the only things that it's labeled for is narcolepsy and something called myoclonic dystonia, where people not only have these kind of twisting motions, but they have these kind of myoclonic jerks like Tourette's. Uh, very rare, but they read the, the myoclonic part of it just responds to alcohol. So anyway, that's the answer. So if you are alcohol responsive and interested in trying the drug, there is something in clinical trials. Another, um, another uh, question for the panel, how effective is Botox in treating tremor and where do you inject it? Who wants to take that? Well, to me, the key is to decide whether it's essential tremor or whether it's a dystonic tremor. So there are people who have, the, the, my description is they have spasmodic dysphonia with an overwhelming tremor component. So in other words, they may sound very wobbly like this, but every now and again you hear a catch or a grab or that kind of a thing. That kind of a person may be treated very effectively you know, even if the tremor component is, but you have to try and see. So you, can, you tell those people, you definitely should do a Botox trial because we, we hear those occasional spasms. If we hear absolutely no spasms, it's just a wavering, so like a wild singer's vibrato, Botox isn't gonna help. But if you have even a little bit of dystonia, then Botox is definitely worth a trial but in some cases, the tremor is amazingly reduced, but in some cases, you get rid of the grabs, but you still have a lot of wavering. So it's kind of variable. Now that said, there's also room for people that have pure essential tremor, fam familial essential tremor, or essential tremor, that have a regular tremulous voice, as Dr. Bastian pointed out earlier. Um, Botox, so if you, the best treatment for essential tremor is oral agent, but in vocal tremor, uh, hand tremor is probably 70% respond, head tremor around 60, vocal tremor probably 50-50. And so it's still worth trying oral agent because if you can take a pill and it goes away, it gets much better, that's all you have to do. But for the ones that fail, we do inject people and it depends on the, which are the muscles that are shaking the most. It doesn't make the tremor go away. It will reduce the amplitude of the tremor, so it may be less significant in the speaking voice, but it'll still be tremulous. And whether where you inject depends on where the patient has most of the shaking. If it's at the vocal cords, that's what has to be treated. If it's the whole larynx moving up and down in the neck, then you need to inject the strap muscles that move it up and down so that you don't get this kind of sound. But the consequence of that is that the more you weaken that muscle, the harder it is to swallow. So you have to balance fixing one thing and not harming something else. And that's part of what we do in all of these toxin injections because the disorder is functionally specific, the treatment is not. Um, one, one point on that maybe is that uh, oftentimes we were um, <coughs> mentioning earlier that in the diagnostic paradigm, we rely on, a lot on clinical history and then on vocal phenomenology. In cases of tremor, I would say it's, uh, as, a, as opposed to spasmodic dysphonia, the endoscopic exam that you do in the office with a little scope in the nose asking people to perform various phonatory tasks is probably more important in tremor than in spasmodic dysphonia to try to target, as Dr. Blitzer was mentioning, the type of tremor that someone may have. Do they have an entire up and down shake in addition to vocal fold 
motion in a tremulous fashion? Do they have one or the other? Um, and then one other, one other comment is that something that we've tried, and I don't know if other panelists would care to comment on this, but uh, for some people with uh, tremor, um, non, let's say non-dystonic uh, tremor, they will have a feature where they have a little bit more Catherine Hepburn up and down of pitch during sustained voicing or even conversational voicing. Yeah, you know, he's like an old lion who needs to remind himself he can still roar, you know, kind of up and down. Um, versus the more uh, glottal pattern where it's more um, e e e in the trend and the pitch doesn't vary that much. In those cases, sometimes what we've tried is cricothyroid injections versus t uh, thyroid, thyroarytenoid muscle injections. Um, I don't know if other people have tried that or if they comment or found any difference or if it's all hogwash, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, haven't tried injecting any other muscles of that sort, um, but uh, I, I think that that does qualify as something that's a dystonic tremor in that it does have pitch variability. Um, also agree with the uh, experience that sometimes the improvement in tremor can be quite astonishing and many times not so much. Here's a question it's specifically for Dr. Bastian. If breathiness is extended after Botox, might that mean that I have muscle tension as well? Muscle tension. As well. Well, you know, MTD is a bugaboo of mine um, because I think, you, you know, everybody uses a term to mean something different. And for me, MTD is a term that I reserve exclusively for non-organic or psychogenic voices. I'm sorry, not non-organic, for for a functional voice disorder that is not neurogenic. So in other words, people will often say that this is muscle tension dysphonia, but I say that's SD because they, they respond perfectly to Botox and they also will have the occasional graft. So in other words, maybe they're mostly that strain, but they have the, so, and if you sustain, you can hear the, the variability and the neurogenicity of it. So uh, back to the question about the breathiness, if the breathiness is excessive at the beginning, to me that's simply a dose issue. And uh, just a word uh, to you all is that there are places where people think that unless you are excessively breathy, they haven't done the right thing. And one of your jobs is to say, but I don't want that kind of breathiness. I've had people come to me after being treated for years somewhere else and they, they say to me, oh, I just hate the Botox injection. Well, why is that? Because I just whisper for a month. Well, why didn't you lower your dose? Well, the doctor said that that's part of it and that I have to do that for a month or it won't work. And so that would be my answer is, and our, our dose range varies in our uh, clinic between 0.25 units that split equally between two sides and I think eight units is our highest, but our average is about 1.25, split equally. When I say dose, I always mean split equally. We have the very rare unilateral patient, but if we get excessive breathiness, we just keep lowering dose. And that's what I would do for someone who complains of that. Yeah, there's one, one more question that uh, may be generically interesting. It says, can you test for the presence of antibody? So the answer is that there, there is not a good so-called ELISA assay where they can measure antibodies specifically to the toxin. Uh, it's always been a mouse protective assay, and now they have a hemidiaphragm prep and a whole bunch of things where they take your blood and they protect, they inject it into some animals and they don't do others, and then they give them all toxin. And if the animals that get your blood don't die or have significant weakness from the toxin, then you have antibody. But it's a very kind of crude assay, and there's a lot of work on trying to come up with something better. The be and it takes a couple months to get the results. So the best, the best way, because I get a number of patients that are sent to me that they've been injected and now they don't respond anymore, and could they have antibody? The first thing I do is I take 10 units and I put it right in the forehead. And if the wrinkles go away, because it's very hard to miss, the patient looks better anyway. Cause, didn't cost them anything for their cosmetic improvement. And you know that they don't have antibody because otherwise it wouldn't work. If you put 10 units here and there's zero 
improvement, then I assume that they probably have enough antibody to stop the toxin from working, and then you should do something else. So if it works in the, the so-called forehead uh, line test, if, if that works, then it's just technique associated with the injection and dosing and whatever, but it's not antibody. And that, that's enough of a test, I think. The other thing to know, uh, which I don't have a lot of experience with yet, so I can't tell you, is that uh, Joe Jankovic's group at Baylor had a number of people with cer cervical dystonia in particular who became secondary non-responders. And so they had to switch them to B, B, is that doesn't the duration of benefit isn't as long, and there's some other consequences to big doses of B, and so they did. Um, they decided, well, what would happen? Uh, it, you know that if you have allergy shots, and uh, uh, so that you don't respond to pollen, that after a while, your your antibody blocking antibody levels fall, and you start getting allergic symptoms again. So you need some boosters to kind of boost it up, and same thing with some of the. Uh, antiviral inoculations to, you know, to measles and whatever. You need to, at some point, your antibody levels are low enough, you may need a booster. So the question is, how long does it take for your antibody levels to lower so that you could then be given A1 toxin again and get a response? And the problem is we don't have a good way of measuring the antibody, so it's hard to know when that is. So uh, with a, a immunologist down there named Atasi, Joe Jankovic, took some of their patients and they parenthetically chose one year of getting B and then re-challenged them with A to see if there was a response and in fact there was. Now once you're primed to develop antibody, which is what happens for allergy shots and you know antiviral shots, uh, your antibody levels will come up. But it's not clear in terms of the doses that we use for focal dystonia is how long that takes. to be out, Is that dose enough to prime it? We know that you have primed lymphocytes because you already became a non-responder. How long does it take to charge those up enough so that they're making enough antibody to prevent a response? And we don't know that, but so far, at least six to nine months, the group in Baylor with, with torticollis are still responders. So I took some of my non-responding uh, laryngeal patients. Now, laryngeal non-response for laryngeal injection alone is rare because the doses are so small that the challenge is minimal. And it probably everyone makes some antibody, not clinically significant. But I have some people that also get, you know, they have m multicranial dystonia, so they got their eyes and their jaw and their neck and their larynx all injected, and they've become non-responders, so I inject you inject their neck, no response. You inject their larynx, no response. You have to do something else. So I took some of these people after a year and started to inject their larynx with A again, and they're responding. I can't tell you for how long that will continue, and the dosing was the same dose that they had when they were stable before they started to have non-response. So it's just interesting. And, and uh, so if, you, if you're one of those people, if you wait a year and you're not happy with B or whatever else you're doing, you could get A again and probably respond. It's just something to know. So with that, I think we've used up our time, but thank you for your attention.